Hey, welcome back to Atheist Edge. I'm Jim. I'm here with Brady, Kevin, and Richard, and we're just gonna sit and powwow for like half an hour. So enjoy. Richard, I got a question for you right off the bat. Yeah. I, I'm not real familiar with your work, but I have read some of your stuff online. Uh, I've read a little bit of a couple of your books, and I noticed that your um, your brand of mythicism seems a whole lot more, well, let's just say more refined than that of like <laughs> the Zeitgeist film. Holy cow, yes. And so uh, I, yeah. I wanted to get your thoughts on the Zeitgeist film. What, yeah. what, what did you think of that? I'm not a fan. Obviously, uh, yeah. Uh, I have there's a I have a white no I don't, I have a blog on my old blog about uh, my reactions to it. But no, it's it's all bad history in that. And of course, there's a lot of other weird stuff in that movie too that's not related to mythicism that I also don't agree with. But uh, but no, it's mythicist stuff. It's it's using the wrong facts. And I this is also true in Religious, um, the mm-hmm. movie with yeah. uh, like Bill like Martin. he could have done that scene with accurate facts. Like like it's not like he was making up the concept, but he's using the wrong examples, that, like the Horus. The Horus thing is just all wrong. Like the, yeah. the data just doesn't support these wild claims being made about Horus the god. And the parallels that do exist are smaller and more abstract, right? And uh, with different gods, and Horus isn't even one of them. Like it would be Osiris more than anything. Yeah. Um, but the parallels are few, and it's more of a, of a, the kind of parallels you see across all of these gods, it's more of a cultural trend more than, like a genre more than and like it's not copycatting. It's not like mm-hmm. they're saying we're going to make a Jewish version of Osiris. It's yeah. like we want a Jewish uh, savior god. Look at all these savior gods. We see some trends. Maybe our god would give us one of those too. And then so you can see how like conceptually they would think, yeah, surely God would give us a savior that's a real one, like the versions of these. Similar to what happened when the Jews were in exile and borrowed a resurrection and uh, the resurrection and apocalyptic beliefs from the Zoroastrians. They figured like, well, if your god can do all that, our god can. Do that and so then you get this development in intertestamental Judaism of the idea of apocalyptic resurrection that looks exactly like the apocalyptic resurrection teachings of the Zoroastrians, but it's Judaized, it's changed to make it more palatable and more acceptable, scriptural, and all of that. So, do you think, like the Zeitgeist, do you think that that's done more to hurt mythicism, or do you think it's like any, <laughs> any publicity? Oh my good gosh. Publicity? No, they're just, it's just, they're cranks. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's earnest, right? Uh, no, no, I don't think, I don't think, I don't think like it's a deliberate uh, false flag, right? Like, I, I think they, the people who made it, like, genuinely believe this stuff. But it poisons the well for the Correct. legitimate research. Yeah, yeah, and I have this, I deal with this, so like Joseph Atwell and. Uh, Akaria S. when she was alive, um, like they and their fanatical fans just can't realize or admit that these guys are just doing it wrong and are making it really hard for this to be taken seriously. Because this is what happens. Like I'll, I'll say, oh, mythicist, and they go, oh, that's crazy, and they'll rattle off all these things that are ridiculous. Like, yeah, that's Akaria S., that's a, a Joseph Atwell. Yeah, it's a conspiracy. The Romans invented Christianity to pacify the Jews. I'm like, no, that's the crank theory of Joseph Atwell. And like, so they do make it harder. And yet these people like passionately believe in like, no, there was no Jesus, so they really want this to be accepted, but they're the ones who are making it unacceptable by pushing these these theories. And they get really angry when I point this out because, you know, that's what happens when you have tinfoil hatters doing they're this. They're thinking, stuff. you're supposed to be on our side. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I had that literally with Akaria S. saying like, like you shouldn't be criticizing your fellow mythicists. Like, this should be a, a good boys club. We should be handshaking each other and promoting each other's books. And I'm like... No, we shouldn't be talking about the truth. (laughs) (laughs) Not on stuff that's going to get me embarrassed publicly. (laughs) Well, similar to that, I mean, because you referred to the miscranks, you know, and the choosing of sides and stuff. In in your book, you uh, uh, recommend Bart Ehrman's book, Interrupting Jesus, Mm -hmm. but y'all had some conflict, or Jesus Interrupted, excuse me, but y'all had some conflict over the book, Yeah, you know, did Jesus exist? Mm-hmm. As a matter of fact, on, on his website, this is yeah. this is what he says. Yeah, I know. Yeah. He's on, <laughs> and, and maybe we we might find some common ground here. We might yeah, find yeah, that yeah. we're we're good friends. <laughs> but this is a paraphrase, a little bit of a paraphrase of he says he's, uh, he says of you that you say, Airman doesn't actually know what he's talking about. That he speaks with absurd hyperbole. That his arguments uh, make him look irresponsible. That he is guilty of sloppy work that he misrepresents his opponents and misinforms the public, that what he writes is crap, that he's guilty of arrogantly (laughs) dogmatic and irresponsible thinking, that he's incompetent, makes hack mistakes, and does not act like a real scholar. So I guess my question would be, is there anything else you want to get off your chest? <laughs> well, I, I it's worth 
Sometimes it's like like Richard Dawkins with Ben Stein. No, no, no. I said something much quite better. Yeah, oh, it's just yeah. pointing out that a lot of that is taken out of context, so that it, it, it's not fully inaccurate. But for example, the, those are specific comments made about specific things that he did. Not so it's like like the incompetent one. Mm -hmm. I don't call Ehrman incompetent in general. I say like this particular argument is incompetent or demonstrates incompetence in this one particular thing. And so if you just focus on, on those things and pretend like I'm calling all his work and everything he does incompetent or all of those other things, mm -hmm. no, they're, they're those in context, those are specific arguments I make and I actually provide the evidence that shows that they're true, right? So it's not just that. I think he phoned it in on G did Jesus exist and, and even some people suspect that he had a grad student do it and doesn't want to admit uh, that that was the case and therefore he can't like, correct the errors in it that are like really bad. Because it was really sloppy work compared to like for example forged or uh what the, that's the pop market version but forgery and counter forgery was the official academic book those are really excellent books he did really good job on those and so he he can do this it's just he has to actually put in the time and not re-engage in polemics when he's do you thinking. think he does it i mean you're looking at it very personal because it's your about you do you think he does the same about other foes that he has that he misrepresents them misrepresents I don't information. know I can't say for sure because I haven't like so so uh, issues that I haven't studied the debates that I'm not involved in I haven't like researched to see who's right on, on, on those particular sides uh, like for example like and usually when I'm dealing with criticisms uh, of or from airmen it's about me so <laughs> uh, so like for example when he criticized me for talking about um, Jesus being considered a form of a god very early, you know, like the beginning of Christianity, he like tried to mock me over that, and this was in Not the Impossible Faith, which he mistakenly thought argued Jesus didn't exist, and that's not even correct, which shows he didn't even read the damn book. But anyway, uh, On the History of the City of Jesus came out years later, and I, that was different. But um, but then he comes around, he comes out with this book uh, a few years later, uh, How Did Jesus Become God, or whatever, where he's like extensively defending the point that I was making, that he was mocking just a few years before. I never got an apology for that, or <laughs> so. We, uh, that's the one we did for our book club a couple months ago. And yeah. the thing is, is like he's citing all these other scholars. Oh, look, they demonstrated this and all of this. And I'm like, yeah, I was mentioning those scholars too, or, or relying on them as well. I was like, nice for you to come around eventually. So when he does the work, he gets he gets correct results. I think it's just sometimes he just doesn't. He thinks it's easy, and he doesn't have to actually research these things. So that's that's, a, and I think also because he's not a historian, he doesn't have automatic background knowledge, and so he should be fact checking some things. So, for instance, he made a claim that we don't have census records or death certificates or anything from the ancient world, which is actually massively false. We've got lots of these kinds of documents. We just don't have them for Judea, which would be a, like a more correct thing to say. It's like, yeah, we can't expect to have the death certificate for Jesus. That would be a ridiculous thing to expect, even if that one existed. So yeah, that's the fact that we don't have it is not an argument that he didn't exist. That'd be awesome though, wouldn't it? <laughs> there are lots of ways we could have had documentation. But that. you know, but along those it's lines... It's just unlikely it would survive. He claims that Jesus is the second most independently attested person yeah. in, Palestine of the, the, in Palestine of the era, with the other one being Josephus. Uh, the G a Jew, though, specifically a, a first century Palestinian Jew, I think he mm. says. Um, uh, the Herods are actually better attested. But... Um, yeah, I, I pointed that out too, that the Herods are actually better attested, but th that's, uh, that's of course the circular argument. You're saying like, what do you mean by attested? Uh, do you mean just it's mentioned in myths? You know, like, so if it's like the Gospels, you have to actually establish that he is attested, that's the thing. And if it's all based on the Gospels, and the Gospels are mythological, and all other references to Jesus are based on the Gospels directly or indirectly, you actually don't have any attestation that Jesus is historical, unless you can actually establish that, you that the Gospels get were legitimate. You can get history out of the Gospels, yeah. So it, it just goes all the way back to the same argument uh, all the time. So I don't think that kind of argument is sound. And I give examples on my blog of Hannibal, Spartacus, um, Julius Caesar, someone even tried to say, uh, Alexander the Great. Uh, there have been actual legit scholars, like even more renowned than Airmen, who've said, uh, Sanders, for example, said that... Uh, Jesus is better attested than Alexander the Great, and that's like the most absurd thing to say. And that's an example of like, did you even check? Like the, the kind of evidence we have establishing Alexander the Great existed is massively extensive. Now we can't expect to have had that kind of evidence for Jesus, even if he did exist. So it's, it would be an unreasonable comparison the other way around as well. And, but, and this is a question, but isn't the uh, earliest attestation that we have of Alexander the Great a couple hundred years after he no, lived? No, we have tons of contemporary attestation. Okay. We even have an actual uh, report from eyewitnesses or from uh, uh, functionaries in Babylon who were alive at the time 
of the date of his death. Like we actually have a cuneiform tablet where it records the date of his death of time and everything. Astrologers, court astrologers did. But we've got uh, coins, we've got inscriptions, we've got uh, sure. statues, we've got um, uh, particular uh, authors of the time, speech makers. We've got a lot of the, the speeches of classical Athens talking about this Alexander guy that was a big problem for them. Oh, so, wait, so, I'm probably thinking more of the events of his life, I think, is, is maybe what I was thinking. Right. right. If you're, not, no, not, you're just right, talking about his exactly. attitude. Exactly. So if, if, if you want to get into, like, what actually it. happened, now, 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 we, now we're getting into a different point. No. Okay. But see here, you're talking about, so 500 years later, is Arian. Now, we have some uh, historians before that. But if you look at Arian, Arian tells us that his methods, he says, I use three eyewitness accounts. He names them, he explains who they were, he explains why uh, they're reliable. And then he says, when they agree, I'm just going to state what happened, and when they disagree, I'll say how they disagree. And so Arian is giving us a much more reliable, even 500 years later, he's relying on eyewitness stuff, he cites the eyewitnesses, he's actually using their texts. We don't have that for like the Gospels, we don't have a thing like uh, where you have someone, let's say Luke, saying, yeah, I've got all these writings from the apostles who were actually there and saw Jesus, these are the names of them, this is the books they wrote, this is why I trust them and this is how I'm using them. And so like, we don't have that uh, for Jesus. But we do for Alexander the Great, even if all we had was Arian, which was 500 years later. But we have much more for attestation of his existence, which is different from specific events of his life. You know, people debate like what actually happened in the time of Alexander. I, I got another question about that, but l let me just ask you this one. With what certainty do you have, if you could quantify mm -hmm. it, that Jesus did not exist. Let me let me answer for him. Yeah, I'm gonna answer for him. <laughs> Thirty-three percent chance that he did exist. One in three is what I come up with. One, one in three. Uh, yeah, that's on my book uh, on the historicity of Jesus. Okay. I actually work out the margins of my probabilities on that, like the extremes on both sides. And so I say it's somewhere in between these two values. I cannot assert with confidence that it's anywhere in between. And the, the the one you'd be most interested in would be the top, which would be one in three. That'd be the highest probability. And so I think it's at least as low as that. Uh, one and three, which is actually respectable as of existing. It's just not as high as people want. Gotcha. So what um, what do you think drives the force the hardest that this, I mean, because ultimately you're saying 67% chance that he did not exist. Mm -hmm. what, what's the strongest evidence you you would say then for that? Um, well, I'd say that two factors is, is the fact that we have the highly mythological mythically constructed gospels and no mundane history before them. So it doesn't go from mundane to mythologized, where like we have Alexander the Great where it gets mundane and it gets more mythologized over time. You wouldn't necessarily necessarily expect that though, would you? Not necessarily. Yeah. It'd be um, nice, but but uh, but the fact that that happens, that's a piece of evidence. But the strongest evidence I think and probably the most decisive is how either silent Paul is or how ambiguous he is on the history of Jesus. There should be much more impactful representation of the historicity of Jesus in the letters of Paul. Like, that should have come up tons of times and for him to address it. And the, the fact that it's just not in there is, is actually bizarre. Don't you think that the uh, the fact that those are epistles, though, they're, they're written to churches, they're written for specific incidents, he's not writing biographies, and no. it's definitely that he, you know, it's it's obvious that he's assuming that the church already knows all that. Yeah, but, don't that don't but we know that's not true because he He's actually repeating to them scriptures that they're supposed to already know. He's repeating mm. to them teachings that they're already supposed to know. Uh, kind of an open letter, and not just the more church importantly, court. he's yeah. argue, he's trying to defend his statements against others who are making statements. So, and especially against people like Peter and, and others who supposedly were disciples of Jesus. So he should be facing this argument all the time. He must should have to respond to it like, well, they said Jesus said this, or he was so and so was actually there, or Jesus did this. And there's other examples, like he would use examples of from the Old Testament of models to follow, but he doesn't use examples from the life of Jesus as models to follow. He doesn't quote the parables. So there's, you should at least have, like if you're writing 20,000 words about someone, and that's really what these letters are, for you to never mention anything that happened in their life that, that you actually concretely put as happening on earth uh, is weird. And, and especially when you're arguing with people that supposedly are basing their teachings on what Jesus said or did in their life, they should be posing arguments to him that's based on that, so he should be responding to those arguments. But that's not what we see. All we see is competing revelations. He says everybody sees Jesus in revelations. I get revelations. And even in Romans uh, 16, he says the gospel and teaching of Jesus comes by revelation and from the scriptures. He doesn't mention from the disciples who sat at his feet. Like, it's not in there. So when you add all this up, it's just weird. It looks really strange. Uh, we would expect something different than that. Didn't they... Didn't they wasn't it Paul that said that Jesus was born of a earthly woman and he was an actual descendant of David? He doesn't say earthly woman. He says born of a woman. Uh, and that's, yeah, and it's, it's ambiguous because in the context of the argument, 
he gets to later talking about how we're also born of a woman, but he means alle he says allegorical women. These are uh, Hagar and Sarah, two the woman who represents the earthly order and the woman who represents the heavenly order. We are born of Hagar in the sense that we're born of the world, earthly order and subject Just to Just a natural God. reading of that text, though, you know, in the fullness of time, which seems to place it temporally, in the fullness of time, God brought forth His Son. Oh, it's son, definitely temporal. Born, yeah, yeah, of, a, no. born of a woman, the born thing. under the law, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, under the law right? to redeem right. them that are under and the law. And he goes on so. to explain, like, for us, too, we are also born under the law because we are also born to the, the woman Hagar. He means allegorically Hagar is the world order. It doesn't mean we were literally born out of the womb of the woman named Hagar. Uh, so in the context of the argument, he's talking about Jesus being allegorically born into the world order and therefore subject to it, which is how he was able to kill it with his own death. And then, of course, if Paul had continued the argument, if he had to, he would say that Jesus then became the son of Sarah, just the same way we will be when we get uh, to live eternal life, or actually when we join the city of the citizens of God, or it's basically join the city of God. So you can look at it, and it, it's, so it's ambiguous as to which, does he mean an actual literal birth, or does he mean an allegorical birth? You can't tell from the passage. It's very odd. He doesn't name the woman, and there's no other reason for him to mention being born a woman in this passage, other either, other than <coughs> this particular allegorical argument he's making. So that's it's what I call weak tea. It's it's weirdly ambiguous. Uh, rather than saying you know, and when Mary gave birth to Jesus, or as we know, you know, from the census records that Jesus was born to a descendant of David, or like something like that, that would be much more concrete. Um, no, he's always ambiguous. Even when he says born of the seed of David. He uses an ambiguous terminology, like does, it, does he mean manufactured out of the seed of David, or does he mean literally born to Joseph, uh, who was a descendant of David? Like if he'd said that, then we would have concrete, just one line would have concrete evidence that Paul understood Jesus to be an earthly person. Well, I mean, even though in Galatians 1.19, which, I mean, you have some places That's where... That's the one that gets me. Where it, it talks which about, is, I always well, say, it, the best argument. Yeah, yeah. And, and in some places, you know, yeah, this brothers kind of mm -hmm. almost in the uh, kind of the royal we type sense you know where you know like Kevin and I would say we're brothers, brothers in of Christ Lord, yeah. you know yeah. but in this one it, it, the Greek even sets it up to where he says you know the brother of yeah. the Lord well actually that the Greek says that for everybody so the definite article is commonly used that way in Greek so that doesn't actually mean anything so everybody's well, the but brother. the context of the passage though is yeah. what we well, look that's, at on the Greek that's side. the other weird thing so uh so first of all, yes, I actually think this is the best argument for history okay. that there is. It, uh, the, there's two passages actually that mention brothers of the Lord. Uh, One Corinthians nine has a sort of category of people, and it's unclear what does he mean, like literal brothers of Jesus, or is this just what Christians called themselves when they for the sub rank uh, people? So, um, in the passage in Galatians, the then I point out this. Other scholars noted this in the peer reviewed literature that the grammar actually says he only met one apostle, not two apostles. I met an apostle unless you count. Uh, the brother of the Lord James. The way the grammar is set up, he's saying that this James person was not an apostle. So if we have this situation where oh, yeah. if brothers of the Lord is what Christians considered themselves, if that's what their name was for themselves before Christian, the word Christian was invented, uh, if they're just the brothers of the Lord, that's the name of this sect. If you're not an apostle, you're just a brother of the Lord. Same way, if you're not the Pope, you're just a Christian. I never, okay. so wait, um, but then that would say that the apostles weren't brothers of the Lord. No, no, he no. Was, it, just like distinguishing is, that yeah, this yeah. guy if is not. Saying, I, met, I met the Pope and this Christian named James. You're not saying yeah, the Pope's okay. not a Christian. Yeah, right? exactly. So, like, everybody knows if, if you're an apostle, you're, you're like a super brother of, of the Lord. Super, but, yeah. but, and Paul says, like, everyone who's baptized in Christ becomes adopt, the adopted son of God, and Jesus is the firstborn of many brethren. So, so we know Paul believes that yeah. they are all. Which is brothers. later in Galatians. Galatians. Um, well, later, well, I mean, it, okay, it there, there is. Yes, Galatians, you're right. Yeah. There's, Galatians I was thinking three, of Romans, and also but Galatians, yeah, there's right a right at the end of Galatians three, of getting of Galatians yeah. four. Yeah, there's a passage in Romans that's even more clear. But you're right; it's, it's repeated multiple places and yeah. also in Galatians. But yeah, that's that's once again my point is it's ambiguous. You can't tell. Now, in my book, when I get the one and three result, I count uh, the birthing passages uh, as two to one in favor of historicity, and I count the brothers' passages as two to one in favor of historicity. And so I actually give a four to one odds thrown in there in favor of historicity, and I still get one and three when everything's mapped out in the end. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's why my one and three is based on assuming that that's slight evidence in favor of historicity, but it's not decisive because it isn't clear enough. Uh, he could have said, like, brother in the Lord of, in the flesh, or he could have said, when I, I met Peter who sat at the feet of Jesus. Like, there's a lot of different things he could have said. Which book is yours that breaks it down, Bayesian? On the what, historicity on, of okay. Jesus. Yeah, I haven't read that one. one. So, um, so, yeah, I even allow this to count as a historicity. And this is where I'd like the debate to go, is to actually let's look at all these particular things and put our own odds on these things and, and try to justify them. Like, why are you say, assigning those odds rather than some other? 
that would be a healthy and useful debate. Like, let's put different numbers to it and see what we get and why. Um, and I think that's what needs to happen for us to, get, to move forward on this debate for historicity. But usually what ends up doing is everybody engages in polemics, doesn't read my book, makes arguments against the book that are already refuted in the book because they didn't read it. It's very frustrating.